Well, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to uh, be invited to this commemorative meeting, and it has been a great pleasure to work with David Barker and many others on the Dutch famine birth cohort study that have been, um, um, as it is now, uh, without the influence and inspiration and hard work of David Barker and um, Clive Osman, David Phillips. Um, during the memorial service last year, um, after David passed away, I said um, um, something about one of the lessons that David has taught me, which was to never give in. And I think that was one of the very important lessons that he taught me. Um, another lesson I learned from David was um, writing. He had a definite skill for words. And he used to tell me that there's two kinds of people. There's words people and there's numbers people. And both are very valuable, but he certainly belonged to the words uh, kind of people. And he taught me about the importance of stories because stories really are data with a soul. So I'm going to tell you the story uh, from my perspective on uh, the Dutch famine birth cohort study. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with, with the history of the Dutch famine, I'm just going to really um, quickly go over uh, the series of events that led to a dramatic uh, and acute uh, period of famine uh, that lasted about five months uh, during the last five months of the Second World War. When the Allied forces had liberated France and Belgium, the upward movement of the Allied forces to the north came to a halt when uh, attacks to take control of the bridges across the River Rhine failed, when op Operation Market Garden failed. And then the Germans retaliated, or the, the Dutch government initially called for a railway strike to support the Allied offensive to move to the north. And the Germans retaliated by banning all food transport. So, here you can see um, the south of, of the Netherlands was liberated and here the offensive came to a hold uh, when Operation Market Garden failed and the hunger winter started. The winter started very early and was very severe which caused all the food stocks to run out rapidly and um, in um, the bars here you see mortality in different cities in the Netherlands early 1944 and then early 1945. So mortality doubled in many cities and many people from the western part of the country um, went on uh, hunger um, um, uh, trips to the countryside here to the east to try and get some extra food. So the Dutch famine lasted for five months. It started late November 1944 and ended with liberation early 1945. And rations dropped dramatically. They were around 1,600 calories a day during the war. And suddenly they dropped to around 400 to 800 calories a day. They are responsible for 22,000 deaths. And as you can see here, um, um, the rations really dropped dramatically and recovered dramatically and suddenly after the famine had ended. But I think, as David taught me, um, numbers don't tell the same story as words can. So I'm just going to show you a very small story showing you what the famine must have been like. Holland, late 1944. A brutal winter and a merciless army of occupation conspire to starve a nation. It is known as the Dutch Hunger Winter. For those who survive today, these are haunting memories. I had nothing. I could not sell food anymore. It was a very sick feeling. And you have to get for some kind of sorrow. It was a very sick Dat heb ik gedaan op de Dam, naast het paleis. En ik heb gevraagd aan de kosteres, wilt u zo lang als de oorlog duurt mijn kindje groot brengen? Want ik kan het niet. And this is just one of the very many examples of terrible, horrifying stories of women who conceived and gave birth to babies around the time 
that um, famine struck uh, the Netherlands. This lady actually um, delivered her baby in the Wilhelmina Gasthuis, the hospital that's the predecessor of the academic medical center where we now work. And um, her son has been part of our study. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the results of um, that study later. There are very many other studies of disrupted families where husbands were um, in concentration camps or were working in Germany and um, single mothers having to send their children away because they were not able to feed their children. And one of the stories one of the participants told us was a story of um, um, a mother who was without her husband at the time of the famine because he was in a concentration camp in Germany and she had to um, uh, look after her children with the very small amount of food that she was able to get with, with the ration coupons. And she went to a police um, place in Amsterdam where there was a fire to warm up and she actually um, met a policeman who was um, uh, from the eastern part of the Netherlands and had moved to Amsterdam to help um, uh, feed people. And they fell in love and um, uh, conceived a baby. So this mother um, uh, suddenly had a third baby to take care of and she gave it up for adoption because um, uh, she couldn't take care of it herself. So this baby boy had been adopted uh, um, uh, unofficially. And when he read about the results of the study 50, 60 years later, he actually called us and said, I've been part of this Dutch famine birth cohort, but you haven't been able to find me because I have my adoptive parents' um, name. And this is just one other example of the really stressful situation that many mothers uh, um, uh, went through um, during the famine. The mother on the right-hand side uh, with the newborn baby is actually sending her youngest children away to the north of the Netherlands um, for them uh, to have a better food situation. So this is the boat that actually took them to Groningen, to the north of the Netherlands, where the food situation was a little bit better. And only people with an official registration card could get coupons for extra food. So you had to be registered at birth uh, officially um, uh, to get the coupons. And for the audience that's very attentive, Roseboom is not a very common name in the Netherlands. So these are the, the coupons of my um, <coughs> father and my mother, who were both born um, during uh, uh, this period of time. My father was born 18th of November 1944, so just before the famine, and my mother was born a month after um, the famine had ended. So, to quote Kent, egg-wise, I'm 70. This is, this is my grandmother um, um, when she had just uh, conceived my mother, and the egg that made me must have been laid down. Um, during the first weeks of um, the Dutch famine, actually. Uh, so there's another layer to, um, to this story. And um, to, to go, go back to um, uh, David's work and David's hypothesis and how the Dutch famine fits into um, to his work, he obviously um, 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 was interested to see what the effects are of undernutrition during fetal life on later health. But he wasn't the first. Actually, just after the Dutch famine, people realized that uh, the famine created a unique situation that allowed uh, a semi-experimental setup to investigate the effects of, as it's called in the first Dutch famine paper, the effect of wartime starvation in Holland upon pregnancy and its product. <coughs> um, well, as you can see from the pictures, there's not many pictures from the famine because the Germans didn't allow the Dutch to actually have pictures. So all the, all, all the cameras were taken, but there were some secret uh, pictures um, taken. And these are two babies born around the time of the Dutch famine in um, the Wilhelmina Gasthuis, uh, the hospital that um, um, has kept all the birth records of these babies. And as you can see, Babies um, did suffer from this acute period of undernutrition. Their birth weights um, were lower. 
And um, one of the first things um, my colleagues and I did um, um, to set up um, the Dutch Hunger Winter Study was working with these birth records that have been kept um, from the Wilhelmina Gasthuis. And as you can see, um, here is one birth record with a different name, Westergasthuis, because the Germans didn't allow the Dutch to refer to their royal family. So during the war, the Wilhelmina Gasthuis became the Wester um, Gasthuis. And it's amazing to see the amount of detail with which the nurses and the midwives and the doctors have kept record of um, uh, the course of pregnancy, the mother's weight, her blood pressure, the size of the baby and the placenta at birth and a written description of um, labor, um, the length of the umbilical cord, the feeding during the first two weeks. It's really um, very detailed. And what we did during the Dutch famine study is that we included 2,414 babies who were born around the time of the Dutch famine between November 1943 and February 1947. So we have two control groups, a group of babies born before the famine, so they experienced the famine in their first year of life, and a group of babies who was conceived and born after the famine, so they were unexposed um, uh, entirely. And then there's three prenatally exposed groups um, because the famine only lasted five months. We can distinguish effects of exposure to famine in late gestation. These are the babies who were born during the famine. Those are the light ones. Babies exposed to famine in mid-gestation, so conceived before the famine and born after it. That's my mum's one of, one of those. And uh, people who've been conceived during the famine and spent their first um, a few weeks of intrauterine life being exposed to the famine. So they were born well after the famine had ended. And most of the participants in the study consider themselves as a control person because they think they were uh, born well after the famine had ended. Well, here are the birth weights of the different five different groups. And you can clearly see that both boys and girls are lighter when they've been exposed to famine in late or mid gestation. But interestingly enough, Babies who have been conceived during famine and uh, were born well after the famine had ended had normal birth weights. They were comparable to those who had not been exposed, probably because their mothers were well fed or at least better fed during the second and third trimester of pregnancy. So we followed up all these children at the ages of 50, 58, 65, and now 68. And here is a summary of what we found at the age of 50. The babies who were exposed to famine in early gestation, they had normal birth weight. So based on their size at birth, you wouldn't have thought that they had been programmed. But actually, they're more obese. They have more atherogenic lipid profiles. They have disturbed coagul blood coagulation. And they have doubled rates of cardiovascular disease. And this now translates in um, a more cardiovascular mortality, actually, in um, in this group. I could go on and on to tell you more about the results of the study, but really this is, this is the summary, I think. Famine exposure had huge effects on later health. These effects are dependent on its timing during gestation and the organs and systems developing during that time. Um, and the effects of famine are independent of size at birth. As you can see, we found that especially early gestation is a very um, sensitive period and babies conceived during the famine had reduced glucose tolerance, more obesity, um, more atherogenic lipid profiles, more cardiovascular disease and more cardiovascular mortality. But they also had more breast cancer, more depression, different food preferences and they performed worse on a cognitive task. Interestingly enough, um, uh, um, whether it's all uh, negative consequences, well, there's one potential positive consequence, which is increased reproductive success in uh, the people who have been conceived um, during the famine. So our next question really was, what are the potential mechanisms by which undernutrition during gestation may have affected the health of these babies? And we found indications for increased stress responsiveness, so um, physiological changes that might explain why people exposed to famine have more cardiovascular disease. 
We found differences in insulin secretion, which might explain partly why there's more type 2 diabetes. But we also found structural differences in the blood vessels. And we've, we're just in the process of looking at uh, MRI scans of the brain, where we find structural differences in the brains of babies conceived during the famine that are associated with poorer um, uh, performance on cognitive tasks. Um, as I said, we find differences in, in food preferences. Be babies conceived during famine have a preference for fatty foods that leads to higher cholesterol levels, and that partly also explains why they have more cardiovascular disease. And obviously, we've looked into epigenetics together with uh, Professor Mark Hansen here from Southampton. And so far, and we've only just looked at four loci, we've not been able to find any differences in methylation between exposed and unexposed babies, but we have found that DNA methylation is associated with later health. And um, uh, a different group from Leiden University has investigated epigenetic differences, and they've been the first to report that um, uh, the siblings of the same sex siblings of exposed um, uh, individuals have epigenetic differences in the IGF2 gene uh, with um, lower levels of methylation in those who've been exposed to famine prenatally. And I must say, I think this is a fairly small effect. There's a 5% lowering of uh, methylation, which is unlikely to explain away the doubled increase of uh, doubled rate of cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease and interestingly enough um, um, they suggest that based on these findings uh, the epigenome might be the best archive of a prenatal environment however those changes that they've reported are not associated with any cardiovascular disease risk measure nor have they found any increased rates of cardiovascular disease and they go on to con conclude that they could not confirm earlier results from the Amsterdam study uh, uh, finding more cardiovascular disease and earlier onset of cardiovascular disease and more mortality. And they uh, conclude that um, possibly uh, this was just a chance finding. Well, I leave it up to you whether um, uh, you think that what we found in a Dutch famine cohort study is um, a chance a chance finding um, or not. But I think um, the previous speaker said something about you are what you eat and I think based on our study you could also say that you are what your mother ate and potentially even what your grandmother ate. And these are um, four ladies also involved in the Dutch famine study. The woman on the left uh, conceived her child uh, during the famine and she delivered her daughter, this one, uh, in the Wilhelmina Gasthuis, and she's participated, I think, in every single set of um, uh, the studies. Um, we've just um, had some uh, preliminary studies on whether the, there are transgenerational effects, and there seem to be uh, effects on the health of the children, uh, both through the maternal and potentially also through the paternal line. But that really is something for future um, research. I really wanted to um, end my talk by saying that this was my version of the story of the Dutch famine, but there are many, many other people uh, who've contributed to the study and many have shared their stories like here in the news. And obviously David Barker has been uh, very important, but also I'd like to point out Jan van der Meul, I'm really glad you're here, uh, has um, had uh, a significant role in uh, the study, just like Anita Ravelli. Um, Clive, I couldn't find your picture in the newspaper, in any of the Dutch newspapers, but you've certainly been very important. Um, um, Susanne de Roy and uh, Rebecca Painter, who's here. Uh, she was my, um, I'll say that later, but, but these are the stories um, um, uh, covered in the newspapers, but obviously there's more people who've actually contributed to the research, including many of the nurses here um, on this picture. And this picture was taken uh, on the day that I uh, presented uh, the book that contains um, stories of nine different hunger winter babies that participated in our study and have told their stories from conception to 
age 65 when they retired, and we've tried to link each and every story to um, uh, one of the programming stories of either heart disease, depression, or cardiovascular disease. And the baby I told you about who was adopted um, was actually one of the babies who illustrated the chapter on myocardial infarctions because he had his first myocardial infarction at the age of 40, um, um, suggesting that uh, the stress that his mother had gone through uh, in the early phase of pregnancy may have programmed his heart. I gave the first copy of uh, the book Babies of the Dutch Famine uh, to the director of the Dutch Heart Foundation, who's funded most of our studies. And when he received the first copy, he said, I think, based on your studies, that uh, prevention of cardiovascular disease starts with the birth of a child wish. And obviously, I um, was very happy with that statement. And I'm even more happy that the Dutch Heart Foundation has now decided to fund a trial um, to actually um, uh, provide the evidence whether we can prevent cardiovascular disease in two generations by um, uh, providing a lifestyle intervention before pregnancy. It's in collaboration with Johan Eriksson's group uh, and the radial study that he's um, just talked to you about and I really look forward to um, doing the study um, together and hopefully I'll be able to tell you more about the results in a few years time. Um, I was just saying Rebecca Painter is, uh, uh, was my first PhD student and she certainly was um, the best. Um, <laughs> she's now a gynecologist and she's been essential in um, translating the findings or what we know from the Dutch, heart, uh, Dutch famine birth cohort study into clinical practice and she's going to tell you what Kate Middleton could teach us about DOHAD. Thank you very much.